Waterloo. Napoleon Bonaparte, the monster of Europe, now spent his days in exile. He was made the ruler of Elba, which had a few people on it, and given the staff so that he could form a little island government. He had a small palace. His mother and sister came to live with him, and the French government had agreed to send him money every year so that he could run his island. Napoleon bustled around his island, working in his garden and adding rooms onto his palace. He improved the roads, built bridges, and tried to make the fields bear better crops. But the man who had once ruled Europe was bored. He was angry. He was humiliated. Tourists sailed to Elba just to see the famous Napoleon in his prison. And as time went on, he got poorer. France never sent a single penny of the money it had promised. Back in France, Louis XVIII was not making himself popular. He was determined that people would treat him with the same respect that the Bourbon kings of France had always been given, just as if the revolution had never happened. In his first big public appearance, he fell down and was too fat to get up without help. He wouldn't allow anyone to help him up but the most important of all the palace officials, so he had to lie on the ground until the official could be found. The common people of France began to fear that the king would once again become a tyrant. Napoleon watched his country from a distance. He wrote letters to the soldiers who remained in France. Many of them wrote back, telling him that he should return to France and chase the Bourbon king away. Napoleon knew that the leaders of Europe were discussing sending him much further away to some distant island in the Atlantic Ocean. Once that happened, he would never escape. On February 26, 1815, Napoleon arranged for a ship with soldiers, gold, guns, and ammunition to dock at Elba. He told his mother that he was leaving to go fight again. Good, she said. Go die with your sword in your hand, not sitting here in exile. Napoleon boarded the ship and was away before anyone in Europe realized what was happening. He landed at Caen, France, with his little guard. I am the Emperor of Elba, he announced. I've come with my six hundred men to attack the King of France and his army of six hundred thousand. But I'll conquer. He started toward Paris. The peasants, remembering the bad old days of the monarchy, flocked to welcome him. The nearest division of the French army was sent to arrest him. When Napoleon saw them approaching, he told his own men to play the French national song, the Marseillaise. Then he walked forward, holding open his coat. I am your emperor, he shouted. Do you recognize me? If any one of you would like to kill your own emperor, here I am. Forty-five of your own leaders have invited me back. Three European countries stand behind my return. The soldiers lowered their weapons. Someone cheered. Soon the soldiers were shouting, Long live the Emperor! Hearing the terrible news, Louis XVIII sent his top general to stop Napoleon. But when this general met Napoleon, he found himself unable to arrest his former emperor. He had fought by Napoleon's side too many times. Instead, he joined in the parade. Louis ran from Paris. Just three weeks after landing, Napoleon arrived in the city and took back his throne. Not a single shot had been fired. I am here in the spirit of the revolution, Napoleon announced. I have come to free the people of France from the slavery of the priests and nobles. Does this sound familiar? Napoleon used the same line twice before, once in Italy and once in Egypt. But he didn't bring freedom either time, and he didn't bring freedom this time either. The excitement soon began to fade. Soon everyone could see that the common people of France were no better off than they had been under Louis XVIII. As soon as England, Austria, and Prussia heard about Napoleon's return, they moved their armies toward the French border. They were not going to let the monster of Europe eat their countries one more time. Napoleon managed to raise an army of 72,000 soldiers. He marched to meet the English army at Waterloo, a village just south of the Belgian town of Brussels. The English army, commanded by the Duke of Wellington, had almost as many men as Napoleon's army. 
The battle raged evenly for hours. Thousands of men died on both sides. The English fought bravely. So did the French surrounding Napoleon. Finally, Prussian soldiers arrived to reinforce the English. Napoleon was defeated, and his soldiers scattered. The general who had joined him instead of arresting him was captured and shot. Napoleon's hundred days of power were over. Even from exile, with an unprepared army, Napoleon had come close to defeating Wellington's men. As he walked through the battlefield, the Duke of Wellington kept repeating, A close thing, a very close thing. Many of his own friends lay dead. Napoleon went back to Paris and wrote out a paper, giving up the throne of France again. Then he quietly left the city. For a few weeks, no one was quite sure where Napoleon was. He was actually hiding in the homes of old friends, deciding what to do next. He thought he would like to go to the United States and study botany. But the British shut down the ports of France to keep any ships from leaving until Napoleon was found. Finally, Napoleon gave up and surrendered to the British. Now the British had to decide what to do with him. They didn't want him in the United States, stirring up trouble or back on Elba where he might escape again. If they executed him, the French who had welcomed him back might revolt. The British would have been very happy for France to offer to execute him, but the French didn't suggest such a plan. Finally, the British announced that they were going to send Napoleon to St. Helena, far off in the Atlantic, 1,200 miles west of Africa. The little island was only 10 miles long and 6 miles wide. It was even smaller and bearer than Alba. On October 15th, 1815, Napoleon arrived at his exile. Even on this tiny little island, he wasn't allowed to go anywhere without an English officer following him, so he spent most of his time in the study of his house. He wrote a book about his life, read books in French and English, played cards, and sometimes gave small parties. Even though he was far from Europe, tourists still came to look at him. One English writer, William Makepeace Thackeray, remembered seeing Napoleon. When Thackeray was five, his ship stopped at St. Helena, and a servant took him to see a man walking in a garden. There's Bonaparte, the servant whispered. He eats three sheep every day, and as many small children as he can get hold of. Two years after arriving on St. Helena, Napoleon began to complain about stomach aches. He became worse and worse. Doctors could do nothing to make him better. By 1821, Napoleon could no longer get out of his bed. He asked for paper to write his last will. At the end of it, he wrote, I wish my ashes to rest on the banks of the Seine, in the midst of that French people which I have loved so much. He also wrote, I am not dying a natural death. I have been killed by the English and their hired assassins. Napoleon thought he had been poisoned, but he was probably dying of stomach cancer. A few hours later, Napoleon died. He was buried on the island, but his stone had no name. It merely read, Here lies, as though the name of Napoleon were too frightening to be spoken out loud.